Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Priscilla Yeman, Assistant Professor of Political Science and a faculty affiliate of the Center for the Study of Women in Society. Yeman's research interests include marriage and family politics, American political development and institutions, race, gender, and sexuality studies, and feminist theory, as well as political culture and political identity. Her book, American Marriage, a Political Institution, was just published in 2012. Priscilla, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm really excited to have an extended conversation with you about this book because it's getting great press. It's an important book. Mm -hmm. I know that it is hot off the press. So may I start with a really big question, and you tell me if this is too big as a starting point. What's unique about marriage in America? Wow. Well, <clears throat> it's an excellent question, actually. <laughs> The first answer is because Americans love marriage. I mean, we talk about marriage constantly. We celebrate marriage. We th consider it the center of American society and, you know, representing ourselves. Um, when you compare marriage to, you know, the UK um, or the U EU, um, a social democracy, um, marriage is not, the marriage rates are higher in the US than they are in other countries uh, that are kind of similar. Um, so it is unique in that sense, um, that we really consider it the bedrock, the foundation of our society. That's a very intriguing place to start. Yeah. So <laughs> that, and it really leads to my second question, which I think is at the heart of your project, which is the following. So we're in love with marriage. Marriage is a cultural institution in this country. It is also, for many people, a religious institution. Mm -hmm. But you are really talking about marriage as a political institution, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. What makes it a political institution? OK, well, thanks for asking that. Um, one of the things that, just going back to the unique question, is that um, in a practical way, marriage does many, many things for us in the United States. It is cultural, as you mentioned. It's religious. It's social. It's personal. It's political. And it's economic. So it kind of it kind of has its roots in a lot of different areas that are very important to us. I try to highlight the political aspect to it. Um, but that doesn't mean it's unrelated to those other things. And in fact, that's what makes it political, is that it has all of its sort of arms and tentacles in these other important areas that for us as citizens. Um, so what makes it political is that um, it affects our everyday lives, right? Um, it affects our choices as citizens. Um, it divides us as citizens. You know, some people have access to the institutions, some people don't. Um, there's economic benefits um, that are attached to it. So it has um, questions of power um, that are um, innate to it. So uh, there are, There's much more to talk about yeah. in that answer. But before we get there, um, I, was, I first looked at a library copy of your book, <laughs> which had, did not have the dust cover. And then I saw the trade copy that's available commercially, and I'm showing it to the camera here. I would love for you to do an explanation of this really fabulous <laughs> photo montage that your publisher <laughs> put on the front. So what's this about? So I think it does capture um, the meaning of the book. Um, you know, you have to sometimes people look at it and they think, oh, it's a textbook. Um, but then they see the top, the title. And then they look a little closer and they see that there's a husband and a wife on the top of you know, this important building um, in our American democracy. Um, and it's not a wedding cake, it's the building. And so I, what I, and that the, also that the cover has this sort of wedding invitation type feel, the, a political institution is in pink, which I liked very much. So they did capture this um, public-private uh, aspect to, to marriage. Um, when we think about marriage, we mostly think of it as a private institution. Um, and so, talking about it as a public institution and putting a cover like that sort of tries to refocus our attention um, to that. So let's talk about that again, getting back to the fact that you're a political scientist. One might have expected a kind of history and analysis of marriage to come out of a sociology department mm -hmm. or perhaps a history department or a cultural anthropology department. Yeah. So have you had to convince other political scientists that this is a legitimate approach to this cultural institution? Yes, yes. Well, it's funny because when I, my process around it or my development here, I, oh, on the one hand, when I would tell pl other political scientists, you know, I'm studying the politics of marriage, they would say, what? You know, sort of be skeptical about this issue. 
when I would talk to you know gender studies scholars, um, historians, and sociologists, they would say, "Oh, tell me something I don't know." Of course, marriage is political. So I had to find a place in between. Um, so whereas when we hear about the politics of marriage, we usually might think of the relationship between husband and wife, you know, in a gender question. And while that's important, I I expand the lens um, uh, more broadly, um, looking at the ways that marriage functions politically for everyone as an institution. Um, so I did, over time, have to make the case and show historically and also through government documents um, that politicians are talking about this, insta different, um, you know, the Congress, the state legislatures, um, the president are all talking about marriage. Um, and to, to make the case that it's not just a survey that you check, you know, single or married, right? That there's real politics um, behind the institution um, that determine our political interests. It's a bit of an irony that we are so tenacious in upholding the importance yes. of the institution of marriage while, isn't it 50% of marriages <laughs> fail? <laughs> what do you make of that mm -hmm. paradox? Not only are the marriages failing, um, they are also uh, married. The marriage rate is declining in the United States, so there has been a shift in the way that we view it. Um, what another way that marriage is unique for us is that it's something we imagine is static um, and unchanging, when in fact it has been constantly changing over time. Um, its role in our lives has shifted dramatically. You know, since the constitution of the nation, for instance. Um, so the par I think the thing is we still hold on to it um, in this sort of normative claims of stability. Uh, we still hold it as a moral site uh, for us to talk about moral politics also. Um, when you think about our political arena, there's not many places where we get to talk about morality as a political issue. Um, and marriage is that site um, in which we can talk about what's right and what's wrong and who's included and who's not and, and on what grounds. So even though the reality is marriage is a tough institution, you know, there are many do end in divorce, there's still the normative claims and ideologies around it that um, make it important and economic, right? There's still reasons to marry because it gives you a few things, right? So you do try to uh, use that institution to get the economic benefits, the political standing, the social standing that it offers. Let's talk about where this really ties in in a very dramatic way to current political mm -hmm. debates. You were talking about marriage as the site of moral discussion and mm -hmm. kind of a normative um, approach to social behaviors. Mm -hmm. So obviously gay marriage mm -hmm. is where the institution yeah. <laughs> clashes with the current political debate, right? right? Or at least it's one of the points. Right, right. Could you talk about marriage as an institution as a kind of a um, like a lightning rod for the debate on gay rights? Yes, yes. So there's a couple ways I would uh, answer that question. One is, you know, how it's affecting gay politics first, and then how it's affecting marriage. Um, what happened to gay politics when it got into the marriage question, um, more forth forthrightly than it had in earlier, earlier parts of gay politics that began in the 70s, 60s and the 70s, um, was that the, the shift that no longer can you ideologically categorize who's going to fall on what end of the gay, gay marriage question, the same-sex marriage question. So where it used to be kind of a progressive or democratic stance, you're for gay marriage, stereotypically say, and conservatives and Republicans were absolutely against it. Well, that's not the case anymore. Um, you know, so we have conservatives who support gay marriage. So it's shifted gay politics in that sense, right? It's not just kind of a civil rights in a uh, sort of traditional way that we imagine that to fall and partisan-wise. The other is to say that once the gay marriage took over as the political focus for same-sex politics or gay and lesbian politics, it, it, it uh, shifted a lot of other questions to the back burner, like employment discrimination and hate crimes and uh, alternative types of families, right? So w in this debate of same-sex marriage, we could have also been talking about single motherhood, divorced families, extended families living together. Um, this whole idea that there are other families that need recognition and economic benefits um, is sort of put aside as we focus on this question of same-sex marriage, which is an important issue. I don't mean to say that it isn't. 
Um, but it's interesting how that has taken over um, when all these other issues are still important. Um, Yes, I, I see what you mean. It's something that becomes a sort of shorthand yes. and then opens into this whole bigger right. conversation. One thing to just sorry, yeah, to, to add to it is that um, in the debate about same-sex marriage, what I also find interesting is the question is for or against, really. Um, but what marriage is is never really questioned. And that's one of the things I think is interesting. You know, we don't we assume it's the right thing to grant or, or something that needs to be protected, right, from this, ch you know, potential change. Um, but, or, you know, it should be something that's ex extended, but why, you know, what it is and why it, it is so powerful is never in question. Um, and that's one of its, again, kind of its unique issues that we don't imagine it to be political when it actually is. What kind of evolutions do you trace? You do quite yes. a lot of history here. Yes. So how is our 21st century conception of what marriage is different than it was, say, 100 years ago? Uh, well, that's interesting. I, I, I talk about the history through a lens of a right obligation tension. Mm -hmm. So marriage, on the one hand, is a right, and it's also an obligation, just like citizenship. Right. So we have obligations as citizens. We pay taxes, which we're doing right now. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we're serving on juries, uh, and in exchange for those obligations, we get the right to vote or other kind of rights and benefits that flow from citizenship. And marriage is very similar in that way. But how, what that relationship has changed over time. Um, so one turning point was the 1960s um, with marriage. So we're prior in the earlier periods that I talk about. Um, the focus is on uh, the obligation for marriage, um, the obligation uh, for ex-slaves to marry in their moving from bondage, status of bondage, to a status of freedom right after the Civil War. Um, in the 1960s, with Loving v. Virginia, which is the landmark Supreme Court case that um, made in anti-interracial marriage laws unconstitutional, in that case, they decided it was unconstitutional because it infringed upon a fundamental, fundamental civic right of marriage. So interracial couples should be allowed to marry. And in that moment, I argue it shifts um, what marriage was from a stronger obligation to a notion of a right, which paves the way for same-sex marriage to also come in and say, it's a right, a fundamental right. But the debate about obligation doesn't go away. Um, and, you know, that's coming up also about, well, uh, the obligation to marry. Some same-sex couples are asking for the obligation, you know, that they want to fulfill their civic duties and marry and help stabilize society and take care of their children and gain certain types of legitimacy. Um, so there's some things that change over time for marriage, but there are ways that I chart in the book that there's some, an interesting consistency to the way that marriage emerges politically over time. Um, and that consistency does, is based upon, you know, questions of belonging, um, civil rights, inclusion, and citizenship. What about uh, the intersection of class issues with the institution of marriage? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, you know, those of us who grew up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, mm -hmm. in some ways um, marriage became uh, a bit of an old-fashioned notion mm -hmm. right. and maybe associated with a more right-wing conservative political mm -hmm. stance or with a more moneyed mm -hmm. stance. Do you take apart pieces of where class affects the understanding of whether it's a desirable aspirational institution yes. or an, or an old-fashioned unnecessary one? Uh, not quite that distinction, um, but I do look at how marriage has uh, been uh, an economic policy for poverty, um, which starts in Reconstruction. Um, and so when ex-slaves are um, freed, let's just say, so after the Civil War, you know, the nation is devastated. Um, the question of black citizenship comes up and what to do with all these people, right, that are homeless, literally, right, uh, no jobs, no money, you know. Um, one thing that the government looks to is marriage, to get them married, set them up in, you know, dependent households, right, um, and uh, create uh, lines of dependency, right, so off of a plantation onto, uh, you know, head of household. 
Um, at the same time, though, that right is limited by um, anti-interracial marriages. So blacks should marry blacks, not blacks and whites. Um, and then you see the same kind of relationship spring up with Moynihan, um, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, um, with his famous, you know, the Moynihan Report, which uh, talks about this tangle of pathology. We have African American families in poverty, talking about a culture of poverty, and one strong answer is marriage and family, um, to kind of lift them up out of this culture of poverty, uh, bring them in line with white society, um, and maintain that relationship. And then, you know, with welfare reform in 1996, a s the same theme emerges again where, with poverty and marriage. So welfare reform ends welfare as we know it, um, that mostly being putting a five-year limit on welfare, lifetime limit. But there are two parts to the policy. One is work, and the other is marriage promotion. So uh, federal money uh, that is designated for uh, welfare is was and continues to be uh, funneled into marriage programs, um, supporting marriage as a, as a way to handle poverty. And one of the things I suggest in the book is that we can't talk about poverty so much, we talk about marriage as the way to um, navigate that. And it's a very moralistic um, uh, political discourse as well. So could you describe how marriage programs actually work. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a, an odd notion for us yes. to think that funds are not diverted, but are poured into the promotion right. of marriage. Mm -hmm. In what ways? What does that look like? Well, you could say diverted, um, <laughs> <laughs> and some do. Um, well, you know, it's, it's uh, an interesting process. Um, when originally the law was passed um, in 1996 under Clinton, it was just a bonus uh, situation. So states could get extra welfare money if they set up marriage programs and those could be abstinence only programs um, uh, those could be you know how to how to be in a relationship yeah um, what to do in order to kind of uh, maintain relationships uh, and a lot of this money went into faith-based uh, organizations um, by the time uh, uh, George W. Bush takes presidency he expands um, the marriage promotion. He develops the Healthy Marriage Initiative, um, which is determining more money going into these different programs. And essentially, um, now after some research has been done over this you know, 10 to 15 year period, uh, mostly white middle class people are using these programs. So welfare money that is being um, uh, targeted, uh, targeted is is not going to actually the the people that are welfare recipients. I I'm still wrapping my head around <laughs> <that one, laughs> right. stuff. What about? I want to make sure that we talk about the mm -hmm. Defense of Marriage Act, mm -hmm. and in some ways, some of what you've already said speaks to that. But how does the Defense of Marriage Act actually change the institution? two important ways. One is that it determined um, that uh, s when spouse shows up in a federal benefit over which there are a thousand that are attached to marriage, um, that spouse, that term is noted for a mixed sex couple. So essentially saying marriage is legitimate between a man and a woman and any federal benefits that are offered through marriage only go to mixed, uh, mixed excuse me, sex couples. Mm -hmm. The other important part is that it um, uh, the full faith and credit clause of the Constitution, um, uh, Article 4, says that other states have to honor uh, pub the public records of other states, right? That's the basis of our federalist system. DOMA says one state does not have to recognize a, s a same sex marriage that occurs in another state. So we take for granted that when you are married in Oregon, you can go to California and still be married. If you are a same sex couple, married in California, you can't come and be recognized in Oregon. It, the Oregon doesn't have to. Yes. Um, so those are the ways that it's, it changed it dramatically. Okay, uh, yeah, and I see what you mean. And one other part, yeah. the federal st uh, marriage is state-based. Um, so when the federal government passes DOMA it, DOMA, it is a historic moment because it's the first time the federal government is getting into the marriage business per se. You know. Um, defining marriage on a, as a national issue as opposed to state-based. But on the state level, yeah. in this last election, we still had four states across the country that had some kind of a ballot measure mm -hmm. um, working against 
right. to allowing gay marriage, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. we've got a, a new kind of a national framework for the conversation, right. but a lot of stuff is still happening on the state-by-state -state basis. Absolutely. What's the future of that? Where are we headed with it? Well, it's uh, it's an excellent question. I mean, I think eventually it will happen, um, and that, that, that same-sex marriage will be granted. Um, and recognized. But it may be by state, right? Um, when, when um, you know, it, so it will probably take time. It seems that in these recent Supreme Court hearings, the court is going to shy away from deciding on Proposition 8, which is the California um, anti-same-sex marriage initiative. Um, but they may, you know, overturn DOMA, which would uh, be a powerful move, and, but, it, but still not saying whether same-sex marriage should be legitimate. Um, but I do think that one thing that's striking in the um, in the Supreme Court hearings is that uh, the generational difference. So, you know, the, the um, younger generations or the younger population seems to support same-sex marriage. They don't, they don't have the same attachments in the same way um, that the uh, um, older generation, say, as represented by the justices. Um, so when Alito says, which he did, that, you know, that same-sex marriage is a new experiment, right, it's even newer, he says, than the internet or the cell phone, right, which is, if you reflect on it for a minute, you think, okay, well, let's assume that same-sex couples and families have been in existence for a very long time, predating the internet <laughs> and cell phones. So he is assuming that marriage is, marriage is just so powerful, it actually would constitute something different than those families that are already there, right, that are already in society functioning and being good citizens, you know. Um, and so I think it represents this still this power um, that marriage has, um, that we still imagine it to have. So I don't think it's going away. Um, and if same-sex marriage, you know, that will be a huge benefit. Um, but I still think the discussion of what marriage is doing is, would be an important one to have. So touching on the other disciplines that all feed into mm -hmm. your really fascinating analysis, um, as someone who works in the pre-modern period, I'm a medievalist, mm -hmm. and um, I, I, I think about this as soon as I started reading your work, I was struck by that somewhere behind all of this we have the notion that marriage will civilize people, yes. will make them behave better, will curb unruly, undemocratic, or uncivilized behavior mm. on the part of probably men specifically. Yeah, right. There is a big piece of social control going on mm -hmm. here, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what I, I do say. That That's why, um, well, I phrase it as a disciplinary inclusion. Mm -hmm. And that is the obligation part. You know, when we think about rights and obligation, rights are, you know, uh, suggesting some kinds of freedoms. But obligations are things that hem you in as well, right? Um, and one of those obligations of marriage is, you know, that you will participate in moral behavior, you know, that you are following the rules. Um, and that's where that um, consistent idea that it will civilize, and that's what kind of brings in the uh, conservative approach to it, I think, also, that it's an attempt to recenter the importance of marriage in a time where there's more divorce, where marriage rates are declining, um, more and more younger people are not marrying right away, the marrying age is raising. Um, so there are changes, um, and so this does recenter it in a certain way, um, renewing a faith in what it can do. Um, so we have same, you know, it can offer civil rights in some ways, right? But that comes with also these obligations of certain accepted behaviors. Those used to be linked to dynastic concerns mm -hmm. and heredit hereditary concerns. You don't want any illegitimate children, right. so infidelity in marriage becomes a bad thing and is legislated against because you can sue for divorce if your partner is unfaithful. Right. So there are some very, very old institutions still at work behind the scenes that we not we may not be totally aware of. Yes, that's exactly right. That is exactly right. So I do call it the, obli the obligation part of marriage is mm -hmm. a feudal leftover in some ways. Um, <laughs> you know, and that it, it's interesting overlaid and mixed with the rights, you know, legal rational approach to democracy that we also have, you know, so they are interlinked. And I think that's also why there's such staying power. You know, for the institution. Yes, for, for, <laughs> <laughs> better, for better, for better, yes. <coughs> Excuse me. So, as a, as a last sort of a summarizing question, we've still got a couple of minutes, but mm. I'm curious about how your own trajectory as a researcher mm. brought you to this as your prism mm -hmm. to discuss really broad issues. Yes. You know, well, I was interested in, in the public and the private. 
Um, I was interested, I first came at it as a feminist, you know, who was interested in marriage politics, um, but also the ways that it affects um, race and sexuality and class. Um, and so when the same-sex marriage issue came up, um, I thought, it is interesting, um, this question of why it becomes political. What, what role is it doing? So I guess what I was trying to do was answer that question of marriage is sort of a, you know, this elephant in the room that we don't talk about. You know, we, we do everything around it and for it and in protection of it or in defense of it, you know, um, or try to, you know, deny it, but we don't know what it is doing um, and why it's doing that and why we continually come back to it. So that was the trajectory. It was sort of like this can't be the only time when marriage is an important issue, you know. Um, and when I started to look back, I saw, oh, it really is not the only time <laughs> that marriage, you know, has really become a heated political, passionate debate. And so you've succeeded in really introducing this into the main line academic discourse within political science? Well, I'm not sure I can go that far. <laughs> but in the, in the part of American politics, I, you know, that is my hope. <laughs> One measure of that, of course, is where you're speaking about this research. Are you going to poli-sci conferences? I am or going. Getting, to, yes. Yes, I am going to poli-sci conferences. Thank you. And also the book is published in an American politics and, right. and governance series. Um, so it is not, you know, kind of put off in a separate type of place. It's, it's a part of a, a proper political science series. <laughs> so. I can imagine that having this book in that series comes with all kinds of uh, implications about the readership you're going yes, to get, right? Yes, that's right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Priscilla, that's it. I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you. We could have gone so much longer. Yes. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Thank you. Much appreciated. We've been speaking with Priscilla Yeaman, Assistant Professor of Political Science and the author of American Marriage, a Political Institution. Thanks for watching and see you next time.